So Ruth, what I love about your work is that you make us aware of these big issues and how should we engage with them, but you give us some really practical tools as well. In fact, you've written lots around these issues. Can you just tell us the two books you've written on this issue specifically? One of them is called Saying Yes to Life, and this actually was the Archbishop of Canterbury's Lent book last year, but is still very relevant outside of Lent. And it goes through Genesis 1 and explores each day and what was created on each day, then look, gives um, some deep biblical reflection around those different aspects, but then goes on from there to look at how are those different aspects playing out today. So for trees, looking at deforestation, and I won't go through all of it, but it then leads to an exploration of the situation we're in today, and then lots of suggestions and examples from churches that are taking action. And then the other book is L is for Lifestyle, which goes through the alphabet and takes an issue for each letter. Each chapter is very short and each chapter finishes with two or three very clear action points. So that's a really practical book that's there. And there are other things I've written as well that folks can find on my website. Brilliant. So now, as a church leader, it's important to read those things and really engage with that material. But I guess when you're thinking through maybe your sermon series for the autumn or you're thinking through your small group studies, how do you begin to, I guess, work through the big issues of climate change and the role the local church can play in these very kind of, I guess, uh, in the kind of average week of the life of the church? What can you do practically? What's some of the ideas and things you've been creating with Tear Fund around these issues? Firstly don't see this as something that you just tackle once a year on a special Sunday, though I would really encourage you also to focus on this um, <laughs> on a particular Sunday, but I would encourage you to, as church leaders, to kind of put on a different pair of glasses so that you see issues of the, the wider natural world and of God's world and of caring for people in poverty, that that's something that naturally forms part of of what you're doing all the way through the year and of how you always read the Bible. But then there are some other really good resources that have been put together for you. One of the best things that you can do would be to go to our reboot campaign on the Tear Fund website. And if you just put into your search engine, Tear Fund reboot campaign, you'll find that and that will give you access to a whole range of resources that will help you. There's a climate fact sheet, there's a climate church talk, there are slides that accompany it, uh, there's a video you can show in your church, so there are lots of things there that would help you. And um, there's, a, there's a really good series of small group videos actually with a climate expert called Catherine Hayhoe that could be great to show. One of the things that we're focusing on for this year is called the Climate Emergency Toolkit. And this is something, it's not only a tier fund thing, Christian A. Cafford, a whole range of organisations have come together to produce this. And this is resources for you in your churches, particularly for this year as we lead up to the climate change talks. I guess as a church leader, you might get asked some very challenging questions. It could be even those who are kind of climate skeptics or whatever else. How do you best engage in, I guess, as a church pastor who, um, who is given challenges from his congregation, how do you best respond to some of those challenges? So I think they're good to respond to in group discussion. And, and that's where the Catherine Hayhoe um, small group video resource that's there would be a real help. So she's one of the world's leading climate scientists and is Canadian, is a Christian. And so she approaches these issues as both a scientist and as a Christian. So I think that, or even just encouraging those people to have a look at those videos on their own would be a good way forward. I think there are ways to, you talk about making it not something we do once a year, but a part of our, our rhythm as church, I guess, is um, how would you encourage it to take place? Are there things you should be praying about regularly as we gather on a Sunday, even virtually or in, in person? Or are there things you should be doing in our small groups or in our 
in our notices and our bulletins? What should we do practically to really keep this being on the agenda for Christians? Yeah, I think there, there are lots. So I love you talking about your church bulletins and notices. And it's, I know uh, quite a lot of churches that have it as a regular feature, just a little, either a prayer point or a, a lifestyle tip. In fact, quite a few people use my L is for lifestyle and they take different suggestions from that and put that into their church newsletters. And then praying is so important. And I, and I would love us this year, particularly as churches, to be standing together in prayer for the climate emergency that we are facing. And Tear Fund, Christian A. Cafford and others are again have joined together, we do things very collaboratively, have joined together to, to hold a year of climate prayer. And if you just put into your search engine, Tear Fund, prayer for the climate, you will find resources there that will help you with that, both individually and, and in your churches. And we have a, a prayer text that you can sign up to where you get regular climate prayer alerts. And this really is about us standing together as the people of God on behalf of people who are being pushed back into poverty and on behalf of the wider creation that is being so damaged. I absolutely believe that prayer works. And, and I would ask all of us to take this year to pray together around our climate crisis. Brilliant. Really good, good challenge there for all things to have and how we make prayer upon what we do going forwards. And I guess the final thing is about eco-church, something you've helped been involved with the last number of years. What is eco-church and how can a church become an eco-church? Yeah, eco-church is your kind of one-stop shop for, uh, for getting engaged in wider creation care and actually in your local community. It's not only around environmental things, it involves people too. But Eco Church is an award scheme that you can sign up to and then you work your way to becoming a bronze or silver or a gold level Eco Church and you get an award and a plaque and so on. It's very intuitive. There's a survey that you fill out online and you see as you're doing it how your points add up. And as you do that, you, you can then see the kind of actions, the things that you could do that would help your points to add up. And it focuses on your, as a church, your worship and theology, or so your teaching, the kind of things we've just been talking about, how you manage your buildings and your land. And if you don't have those, that's fine. It just takes it out of the survey. And then your community and global engagement. And finally, how you're engaging on a personal level in terms of your lifestyle um, as congregation, as members of your church. So it really covers the gamut pretty much of church life. And it's a fantastic way, the best way really, to get involved as a church. So do have a look at that and register and get going on the journey. I guess that takes you down from being a massive kind of global issue to being a really personal challenge we can do in our congregations with our people. Yeah, and so when we're thinking about climate change, yes, we can think of this on a global level, but there are so many individual things that we can do too in our churches. So as we're able, once we're able to gather, again, thinking about any church meals that we have, um, are they meat-based or could we go default veg and move away from meat? thinking about how people travel to church. Can we encourage people to car share or walk or cycle? Thinking about the sort of energy that we use. So in your church, who's your energy supplier? You might not be able to get solar panels and so on, though you might be able to, but all of us in our churches as individuals and as church, we could switch our energy supplier. So our energy is coming from a green supplier and so on and so on. There are lots of little things that we can do as well as thinking about those big global issues. 
I guess my last question is, as we think about all this, it can seem like another massive burden to try and carry. How do we make sure it doesn't become a massive burden, but becomes as part of what we do? What would be your advice there? That doesn't become almost another insurmountable thing to try and do to talk about everything else, but how does it become more manageable? So I think for me, it comes down to those glasses again, and seeing this as, as an integrated part of who we are, as people and also as churches. So when we're thinking about prayer, we don't think of that as a, a huge burden and a huge thing that we need to do. It's just a natural part of our church life to have a prayer life and to be praying. And I long to see the church be in a place where caring for the wider natural world is simply, it's just second nature. It's common sense, it's what you do, like we do everything else. And so it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily require us doing lots of extra things. Often it's about doing the things that we do, but just doing them slightly differently so that we're thinking about the impact that we're having on the environment as we do those things. So it doesn't always have to be about a lot of extra stuff that's really expensive. Sometimes it's more just thinking about how can we ensure that this is naturally integrated through all of our church life. Brilliant. So one last thing is, is what is your hope for the church this year in the UK as it engages with this issue? <laughs> that we absolutely step up to the plate and become who God has called us to be in terms of imaging him and reflecting him to the wider natural world and that we recognize that that we're not separate to the environment but that we are part of the community of creation and I think when we are harming that creation and not taking care of it then we're not we're not taking we're not enhancing creation's worship and so this year I would love to see us really getting to grips with the challenges that our climate crisis presents us with not because it's a duty not because it's a responsibility but because for us, it is a should be a natural part of loving and worshipping a saving and creating God.